Welcome to Regulatory Ramblings. Our guest today is Vivian Koo, a local entrepreneur with a passion for tech. She's also the founder of multiple groups, such as Web3 Women and uh, co-founder of Satoshi Women. As someone who's previously been the COO of BitMEX, leading crypto derivatives exchange and the managing director at Glo Goldman Sachs for Compliance, she's also been a regulator, having served in the corporate finance division of Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission earlier in her career. Currently, she's the APAC advisor to Delphi Digital and chairwoman and co-founder of the Asia Crypto Alliance. She's a senior advisor of Stashway, digital wealth management platform and CEO of Digital Boutique Limited, a consultancy providing guidance for digital asset businesses and on the reg related regulatory and licensing strategies and risk management issues that arise when blockchain analytics are used. Vivian has been described by Tatler Asia as a prime mover in cryptocurrency in the region and on a mission to provide leadership and education. She's an ardent advocate for diversity and inclusion and in the power of education to help us get there. Vivian Kier, thank you for joining us. Great to be here. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your, your, your upbringing, where you're from originally, you know, your, your, your formative years to the extent you could share. Sure. Um, so born, born and brought up um, to 11 in Hong Kong. Uh, so my father is Malaysian, um, you know, mother from here. And so went to boarding school at 11 and did that actually all the way through high school. Uh, university, I was in Toronto, and then came back right after I finished university. So first job uh, at, was at Credit Suisse. So my career has been, in my view, um, they call it one trick pony, <laughs> or like very straightforward, as in it has been primarily in uh, compliance, actually majority, more than 25 years uh, in compliance regulator, and then at Goldman, also doing compliance. So it really sort of took a turn um, when I joined BitMax 2019, mm -hmm. and then since then I've been in the digital assets industry. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, now I, I, I guess one could even say your, your career dovetails the broader changes in, in, in the sense that we're seeing greater intersection between financial services and, and, and technology to given how you end up at BitMEX. But, uh, but uh, let's pick up on that. How did, how did you get into tech? I mean, the, the, was it a natural progression or, or was it, or did you say to yourself, this is, this is the state of things to come and I, I want I, I, I to get into this? So, yes, I wish I could say something like, I've always liked blockchain. I know a lot about technology, but it's literally nothing like that. Um, I obviously, I think part of my compliance job at Goldman deals with technology because as you well know, and actually speaking to different speakers, compliance um, from different perspectives, from surveillance, from data, there is a tech component, but I'm by no means uh, you know, a tech specialist. Um, I like it. I'd like to learn about how you can do things different ways. So I always give an analogy or example as in when I first started in Goldman, I was looking at paper reports for surveillance. Uh, and you know, I was listening to tapes, the reviewing emails. I think fast forward to before I left, you know, you could literally when an individual walk into the office or a building, you know, you, you can be traced all the way to are you in a private area? Are you in a public area? Are there any trends? Uh, you know, they see that right after you coming out from a private area that you spoke to somebody was a suspicious. So a lot of things can be detected. Um, probably not through AI, you know, in, in some sort of machine way, but um, so it has been progressive. So that's really my association with tech, technology, I think, from early part of my career. And then in Bitmax, um, I mean, it's, of, is a crypto derivative exchange. Yeah. So, you know, there are many aspects. Uh, I was m mostly, you know, responsible for the non-revenue aspect, given my background. Uh, so on the operational side, you know, help them f build out a uh, operations team, compliance team, legal team. So that was what I did there. It, it, it's interesting you, you, you talk about the level of surveillance within the financial world that, mm -hmm. that, that people at even the, I remember some years ago there was a case at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange where you had two traders swapping drugs and they thought by going up to the viewing gallery out of everyone's view yeah. and passing things behind each other's backs, well, you know, that doesn't work. I mean, I think the point is that when you enter a financial institution, you enter an exchange, 
those are some of the most surveilled places on earth, maybe even akin to a, akin to a casino. And that, you know, that, that's not the best place to engage in money laundering or, or you know, financial crimes, precisely because of how, how evolved, how sophisticated the methods of detection are. Uh, yeah, um, and I'll, I'll just add on that point um, that, but most people don't actually realize. So I think most people in banks realize now. That oh yeah, we, we email, see the cases, the yeah. SFC, uh, the ICC, emails. That, that people who should have known better are getting nailed, and oftentimes not even for much, paltry amounts. <laughs> the, yeah, because I, I don't think they realize the amount of surveillance that happens in the institution or at an exchange. I mean. It, crypto exchange has extensive, you know, from they usually have very strong security team, and then and uh, you know on custody. That's why there's cold and hot wallet, um, you know, people hacking. So if you don't have a very robust security system, then I think it's very vulnerable. Whatever, whether it's a financial institution or an exchange or any crypto companies. And yet, crypto from the start has gotten a bad rap. That it's been viewed certainly in this town, members of law enforcement, former law enforcement, many of whom, as you probably know, ended up at places like Goldman uh, in roles in investigation, security, and compliance. Uh, I remember that the first Bitcoin event, I, uh, I spoke at the first two Inside Bitcoin events in 2014, 2015, and even then, I mean, I remember I, I must have spoken to a dozen former cops ensconced at banks mm -hmm. and other financial institutions in, in Hong Kong and Singapore. And but for one, they were all of the view that, you know, the, the, their attitude was what manner of chicanery is this? Why does the average person need this level of privacy? Because they're looking at it with the blinders on copper's perspective. Everyone's guilty until you prove yourself <laughs> innocent to me. Mm -hmm. And they felt, again, well, that only a criminal would need that level a privacy, right? And it, the the case has been hard to make amongst many in crypto that their compliance standards are up to par because they're they're maybe less now because Bitcoin's not that young. But the the feeling is that there's a wild west, anything goes type capitalism uh, mindset in the crypto world, and that that's why they don't trust the compliance standards as much. Well, I think 2014-15 time frame, that is certainly true. I mean, that, I think very little people knows about, you know, you have to be, they always joke about it, but it's probably true, either being drugs or, you know, in something that's not proper. Like yeah, Silk Road yeah. or, yeah. yeah correct, they, they correct. So, like but that. then if you look at in the more recent past, I mean, last few years, it's been, you know, it it's actually reminds me of, just after financial crisis, in terms of how quickly the regulatory things are developing. You know, after the 2007, 2008, um, you know, after mortgage crisis, after, you know, accumulators in Hong Kong, actually how quickly regulator, you know, got on, got on the case and started pushing framework out. Um, and now, you know, Hong Kong, I know you've spoken to different speakers who yeah. have, you know, spoken extensively about what's happening in Hong Kong on the regulatory side. So I can, I will only see that, you know, as a something positive that it will create a lot more credibility. Now, now like if you're a licensed player that you have to adopt all these compliance standards. Even still, it seems to me that people in law enforcement, they haven't changed their view. But yeah, it does lend more credibility to the market and to, to, to the, this particular medium of exchange. Uh, it, 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 it seems to me that the something that um, Bobby Lee, of BTC, formerly of BTC China, mm -hmm. said about a decade ago, seems to be coming to fruition. That you see more, you see more harmonization of rules. That that. that that it, he said if crypto was to go, at that time it was just Bitcoin, but that if it was to go mainstream, that if it was to have that level of respectability, that it would need to be, there would need to be standardized rules such that the transactions could occur seamlessly across borders and regulators would be reasonably satisfied that the other side's got the same standards that we, we do. Uh, 
I'd like to come to, you know, what what you're well known for locally, which is Web Three Women. Why 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 the need to found that? What what, uh, what, what tell, tell us a bit more about its mission. No, I I've always been an advocate for female. Um, you know, since my days in Goldman. So it's I think it's a natural progression. So I sponsored many programs from analysts to associates to you know, MDs, um, you know, and Goldman. And I've been a very active participant. So when I was in Bitmax, clearly, you know, I was busy, you know, had a lot, you know, on the plate. Um, so mm -hmm. after I left, I felt, you know, I had a, a little more time. So really should focus on things that I felt, number one, I think the community and the market needs. And secondly, I, I'm passionate about. So co-founders of Tosh Women, that's really a more, I would describe it as a more social group, uh, you know. We were advocating for crypto literacy for f female from all walks, and then Web three women. We focus to make them on savvy investors, or just be comfortable with with the technology. And I think to know it. what they don't know. I mean, it could, I think most at that point. I, this you're talking about like two years ago now. So that was when everybody was talking about NFTs. You know, I, you know, all I'm sure boyfriends, husbands. Which you hardly hear about now. I mean, which you hardly hear about, but but you know, like um, in November, and they might yeah. things might change. You know, October, we have yeah, October 30th, the whole <laughs> week. Correct. We have Eight Fest. We have NFT Hong Kong. Yeah. You know, ETH Hong Kong is just right before that. So, I personally, I, I have never been like a big investor in NFTs. I. You know, there are projects out there um, that, you know, Delphi actually put out a piece recently on Yuga Lab. So that's on, on apes. But it talks more about, not so about, you know, you know, the PFP of the ape, but the whole ecosystem about the gaming element, the IP element, and ape coin, how that's used as a utility to fuel the, fuel the whole sort of system. So I think the PFP sort of profile picture type of NFT, the, the market is like dried up and for obvious reasons because there's just nothing substantive to back it. But there will be other things like, you know, there are a lot of people talking about generative AI type NFT and also collectible type NFT. So it would be, I think, the sort of 2.0 of NFT, um, I think, when, when the market comes back. You, you were at Goldman and, and diversity and inclusion has always mattered to you, but that acronym DEI diversity uh, equity and inclusion in order to elevate those that maybe haven't gotten all the opportunities they should have in the past those that are happy with the status quo may well feel threatened mm -hmm. in that environment against that kind of mindset how do you introduce concepts such as diversity so I guess the world, with the, particularly the digital assets field, it's more startup type, although, yeah. you know, various companies are at various stages. So, so I, in a sense, you could make up the rules and, and the norms. You can, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. you can write your own rules, I think, in some aspect. But so Web3 Women, we, I think the genesis of creating that is um, I got together a group of more like seasoned um, female professionals who mostly actually are from traditional finance. So lawyers, accountants, you know, head of communication, founders. So I think they are the ones that actually made the transition into Web3. And so our aspiration is to move those, you know, who wanted to move over. And mm -hmm. also actually if there were junior people in Web3 who have aspirations, you know, is there a way, is that a platform, is that a group that can help them promote them, um, you know, sponsor them. You know, our, our sort of tagline is SEAL, you know, sponsor, sponsor, equip, access, and leadership. So mm, I think... Good, yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to remember that. So I, you know, different, you know, it means different things to different people, what diversity is. And I know actually companies, even for things like ESG, they have yeah. metrics, they have like parameters that need to be met. But our group, in some ways, I have, a, you know, you will hear about all this, other groups that, oh, we want to launch a 10K PFP, we want 100,000, mm -hmm. but we've, funny enough, I've always wanted to stay smaller. <laughs> not because, no, you know, big and impactful is not good, but I want to make sure actually whatever we do, we're focused and we are really bringing over or focusing on initiative that we can do a good job on. So number isn't actually as relevant in my in my mind for what we do. So we just roll a mentorship program. You know, we have maybe two dozen mentee and mentor, but I think we're one of the, f well, I think we're one of the ones actually in Hong Kong, actually who 
have such a group, very strong mentor pipeline, mentee. You know, we're doing, registering things on blockchain you know, to evidence how the mentees are actually participating. So we're just piloting things, and I think by piloting, people learn. And we have like exceptional speakers, a lot of male allies actually who are very supportive. So I think we we will sort of you know tread our own path, but. But um, yeah, so I, I think, as I said, actually different people create groups for different reasons. They have different views of diversity, but, but I think the more institutionalized actually set up, you know, like the banks, you know, HSBC, UBS, that they all have women network, they all have initiative, and I think every division actually have some targets that you know, they should meet in terms of hiring people. So I think those are good ways to promote diversity, but mm -hmm. you really need somebody who has that at heart and really you know, know what they're doing and want to do it to be successful. A, a critique that, that, that's often heard by, by women, and, and there's a lot to this because, you know, anecdotally, this is what I've been hearing as well, that, that there are fewer and fewer opportunities for, for them to build mentor relationships in the corporate world and in the world of financial services. Part of it is men being afraid because of the Me Too movement. Uh, but part of it has always been men forming informal alliances within the company, which leads to friendships and other relationships outside the workforce that women perhaps aren't as privy to. And um, so do you think that in, in, in a more female-oriented, uh, female-dominated environment that that these women, these budding entrepreneurs, these budding techies, can can get the kind of encouragement and empowerment that they need to to realize their dreams. In the fintech perspective, I would say that because primarily technology and um, finance is very male dominated, so uh, you know it, at the senior level. So and then naturally, I think male like certain type of sports, they like certain, you know, they have certain hobbies. So the let natural sort of alignment, as you said, if they get together, that they, you know, the less senior one would talk about, oh, I want to get this other position too. Whereas comparatively to female are not very outspoken. I mean, obviously that, that's a stereotypical term, but yeah. I'll, I'm talking about a general Asian female. Um, even if they really aspire to get a particular pos into a position, they would wait to be asked um, or they don't openly actually ask about or talk about their aspiration. So I think this is where I think some of the programs or initiative that we roll out would be helpful because you hear about senior, you know, you basically have access and you hear about people who are successful in the industry talk about how they did it. Um, you have a connection with them. And then the networking aspect is really, you know, it's more social. I mean, that, that bit is just getting comfortable that you have a group that you can lean on. Right. So Goldman, I understand, is, is a very, pro certainly more so when, when you were there, uh, but before the age of CSR, before the age of ESG. Goldman, I understand, was a very high testosterone, hyper-competitive, very aggressive environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, how how's that shaped you? How's that, I mean, but people say it's toughened them up. You will learn how to handle, definitely handle office organizational politics. I'm told uh, certain employers are g good at teaching you those life lessons. But what, what's been your experience as, as, a, as, a, as a female entrepreneur? I mean, and, and, and what can you say about the challenges I, encountered? I am a very, you know, obviously a, a very strong advocate for diversity, but I haven't really thought very much about the fact that I am a woman, if you understand what I mean. Because I even, you know, whatever job I was in, I always assess people based on are they good at the job. Right. Um, and, but of course, as more, you know, as you, there's specific areas and specific levels, then it becomes harder to find women because they, they are just naturally, they're not in that provision. They are not like in that seniority. So it's just. So it's a self selecting to sample too. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, correct. And yeah. I think Goldman, I, I would sort of characterize it as just similar to many other big corporates. And, um, you know, I, I know actually there's always talk about, you know, people have got sharp elbows, you know, you need to have yeah. a certain per personality yeah, that, um, to be successful. I mean, certainly true for Goldman, but then for, I think, most other corporates, I would say, because for you to get into a senior level, then 
you know, you would have to number one demonstrate that you're very good at what you do. Yeah. Um, you know, there will, you'll be constantly competing with people that's around you. So it's a, a what they call up or out culture, and and so you know, over the years, I'm sure if people who stay in a corporate for long enough, you know, they would work out actually what that culture is and how they get ahead. So I don't actually think that Goldman is that different from, from you know, HSBC, UBS uh, and whatnot. And then more particularly on the diversity front, they do, seriously, they, well, I, this may not be a fair, like, statement, not worked at HSBC, you know, I work, not worked at UBS, but Goldman has an exceptional program for diversity at all levels. And, and back to your earlier point, um, when you, you know, it become harder to get mentors because as you become more senior, that your population of who can be your mentor actually yeah. gets... Who can you turn to? Correct. It's yeah. exceptional, you know, it becomes smaller. Um, when you're younger, you know, if you don't know nothing, then a lot of people can mentor you in different things, like technically, uh, you know, how to deal with people, how to manage time. You know, there, there'll be a lot of people who can be your mentor, but when you get older, when you get more senior, then the population just shrink. Women have made inroads in the banking, finance, the corporate world, especially in this town. I mean, and in, in, in even in Hong Kong now, we're starting to see more women attain degrees in business, finance, law. I mean, there the, the, there's no shortage of women in executive C-suite positions in Hong Kong, yet we still hear about an underrepresentation of women. Um, is, is, is that the case, or, or has the water finally found its natural level, but it's only technology that's the holdout? Um, I, well, they're, they're very, there's a lot of metrics and statistics about yeah. sort of percentage of female, and then you probably have heard of and, and probably know like 30% club, uh, you know, I think the expectation um, of the percentage of female obviously has changed over time. So, you know, when you have 90% men, there was 10% female, then I think maybe at that point it was accepted, well, you know, females should just represent 10%. Right. But then over the years, um, progressively, and then um, there's just been a high expectation in terms of why should there be such a tilt? You know, should it be 50-50? It should be if not like more. So if we're still at 30% or less, then that is clearly a lot of things that still can be done, you know, at the senior le leadership level, particularly. So it's gonna be, I, again, I think it's an evolution, um, things will change. So it start off from where it was, and then now it's trending, you know, there's, there's a lot of things happening. You know, the exchange uh, you have put up metrics, uh, a lot of organizations themselves have self-imposed metrics and ways to, to sort of position and um, groom female. And the fintech space, you know, I talked about earlier about, I think it's just professionally, um, the people who run fintech company because of the tech, because of data, because of, you know, finance, I think most, those are very you know, male dominated right. sort of uh, profession. So there, there are clearly things that still can be done. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, perhaps creative ways of recruitment, uh, you know, to, to, to bring more women in, in, into the fold. Uh, more, more from a macro perspective, uh, you've been in compliance, you're an entrepreneur. What are your thoughts on Hong Kong's legal and regulatory framework uh, relative to fintech, crypto, and Web3 uh, more generally? Are, are there aspects of the local legal regulatory framework that you'd like to see changed? Or do you think it's fit for purpose as it now stands? Oh, that's a big question. Um, so, but, I, and everyone's yeah. going to answer it differently because mm. they, their own particular circumstances right. are different. So, I, I mean, with my profession that I've worked in, like very heavily on the compliance area, I think Hong Kong has a very strong and robust legal and regulatory framework. Um, obviously, you know, evolution, I think, has changed over time. But then, more touching specifically on the area I'm in now, fintech. Fintech. I feel like Web3 has um, now incorporated a lot of the, you know, Web3 basically is subsumed, like all the fintech companies now, all, a lot of them, because anything that touches payment, anything that touches digital assets, anything, you know, basically it's become a very broad term, yeah. or loose, loose term. But it also includes uh, the metaverse and, and uh, right, or the metaverses. 
uh, depending on whom you're speaking to. And, and, and so it's... But yeah, that, that leads to the next thing I wanted to ask you, which was, what are your thoughts on Web3? I mean, we've had Angelina Kwan on the show, mm -hmm. uh, whom I think you know, and uh, yes. she said it about a year ago, it was imperative that more young people start coming up to speed on Web3. Mm -hmm. but it, Because it was going to be such a crucial part of their lives moving forward. Average person hears that and they say, okay, fine. We've, you're telling me there's Web3 coming out? I wasn't even aware of Web2. All I know is there have been various iterations of the Internet. The Internet's been getting better as time goes by. I can do the things I want. Okay, maybe in the beginning I couldn't download movies and whatnot because of the bandwidth issues, but, but that's no longer the case. The average person just uses the state of the technology in whatever age as it exists. They're not concerned about which epoch, which period this is, which iteration, which incarnation is, this is. Why is Web3 important? Web3, well, it's, it's funny you said that. Um, so we have an intern right now. She's 15. Um, she doesn't know what Web3 is. So, but back to my earlier point, I think a lot of, a lot of FinTech-ish kind of, uh, set up elements has been now been branded into Web3. There's no clear definition because it usually include things like tokens, yeah. metaverse, you know, some sort of technology, some sort of digital uh, transformation. I, I actually would take the other side of the argument as in, I think older people actually need to know about Web3. Younger people actually in their daily lives are very emerged into Web3 from Roblox uh, <laughs> to coding um, to, you know, even playing video games. I think, you know, Animal Quest, you probably spoke, I don't know one of you speak, you must have spoken to people in Animal Quest, so big into gaming company for several hundred like investments. So all the, all the games yeah. that younger guys play, they, they don't actually realize those are actually like worth three. They collect tokens, they can use, use tokens to buy things. Those actually are all what you would be considering as Web3, depending on how you structure it. So a lot of these companies that, um, that they put on the you know, metaverse has a gaming element because that's how younger people learn. Because if you tell them, oh, can you read a textbook? Can you like, read this you know, sort of law definition? They would say, oh, I'm too young for that. Can't really do that. But playing a game, you can probably start playing when you are below 10, I think, you know, or around that age. So younger people, in, without a way that they're realizing is very, I think, very uh, immersed into Web3. So your 15-year-old intern who doesn't know about Web3, how, how is that possible given that conventional wisdom, and I, I find that there's a fair amount of truth to it, is that each successive generation grows more tech savvy? Personally, I think she just doesn't un know what comes under Web3. Right. She, she does Chinese history, Chinese literature. So she's kind of, um, you know, definitely. Very different field. Very different field. I mean, she's just young. So when I ask her, you know, she's helping us on our, you know, as an intern project, I ask her, do you know what Web3 is? Because can you do some research about uh, what's lacking, you know, for female? What, what sort of profession in Web3? So she doesn't know what, but I, going back to my point, Web3 is Is that a blessing in some ways? Being Sorry? Clean, having your mind that's a clean slate coming, out, coming to it without any biases or predisposed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm sure if I asked my niece, she's 12, she wouldn't know what Web3 is either, but she would tell me she knows how to like collect, like collect things on Roblox. Right. She knows actually how to do boomerang videos, like digital transformation. She would know, um, you know, how to play in virtual worlds. You know, she's got all her team uh, classmates actually on the same game. So all of this actually is part of what Web3 is trying to do, because you try to use a gamify way to engage younger people. So I don't And think remind them of what they already know. Yes. Yeah. 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 And then they can collect, you know, they can collect things which, um, you know, there are different games that you can actually convert them into money, not in Hong Kong, but, you know, in other places that you can use, like, on what you earn from the game, you know, play to earn. You know, so there's so many different ways that they won't realize that they are actually part of the Web3 revolution that we're going through now. To come to that conclusion requires a big picture perspective, to, to be able to step back and, and see the whole. 
most people are dealing with their part of the puzzle. Most people are mm. looking at uh, things in isolation. Uh, and it makes sense. When you're a student, you study banking and securities regulation and insurance mm -hmm. and futures. And you're, you're taught it in a compartmentalized way. And there's a se there is some sense in teaching it that way because you don't want to overwhelm a student. But the older you get, the more you realize, that one of my professors said, the law truly is a seamless web, that people play games on the security side to influence the prices in the futures market. I mean, mm. it, it's, 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 it's all connected. And, and, and hope, hopefully she'll be left with that realization that Web3 is, is everything. Hopefully after the internship with us, she yeah. will know what it is. And we will we'll teach her, we'll teach her. And, but she's a young intern. I mean, you, you, a normal intern usually is in university. So they, they have some comfort, you know. Comfort. Yeah. And also, because I think the subject that she does, she does a lot more writing. So it, I don't think she has as much exposure, um, you know, on maybe Chinese on the literature device. at 15, that's, <laughs> yeah. must require a lot of maturity though. To, no, yes, to, yes, to correct, study correct. That at that age. So in, in terms of then young people realizing they already know what Web3 is, they're using it in their life yeah. in different ways. How can they parlay that? How can they... How can they use that knowledge towards entrepreneurial ends? How can they jump on the Web3 bandwagon and use Web3 to make a living, make a career, make a future for themselves? So um, I'm also a, uh, an advisor for Inspiring Girls. Mm -hmm. So they have a program um, now that they would teach um, younger girls. Uh, they, uh, the, the range is also like, you know, sort of middle school age in terms of you know playing games and playing games and then um, having model portfolio to see how they can earn it. so this will be idle sort of idle cash like portfolio strategy but money money yeah. is a powerful motivator yeah so yeah. so you know because we we were our brainstorming you know with Ennis she's she's uh, the co-founder so in Hong Kong about can girls of that age actually comprehend how you know how you're going to save money can you do like portfolio construction and then Initially, the, the feedback was it's just going to be don't, too much for someone like that age. And what but were the then, results? And then, but the more we sort of look at it, well, how about if we do it through a gamifying experience or if they have like idle? Because the parents, you know, initially I said, why don't the parents just give them like $100? But then that's not going to work because $100, you can't buy like $10 of HSBC, for example. So there, it's going to be some, I, so they pretend you can have like a model portfolio. Let's say they have $1,000. How do they allocate it? Because Every project actually needs some metrics to assess, you know, if it's successful or not. So, right. it so if we just give them some cash, oh, you go, you you learn all this like in the program, and then you try to do your portfolio construction. So the idea is, by the end of it, they all have this idle cash, and then they will invest and see who comes up best. Because that's what we, when I was in Goldman, like that's how the Goldman intern they they were given like you know, the, this like test net environment. So assume you have I don't know 10k in it. And then you go and research which are the best investments that you can use, given the cash you have, and then do a portfolio construction. So I'm just trying to replicate that with, into the younger like generation and be able to show some results. So it may or may not be relevant, but I think you, we, we, we were brainstorming about all the ways that we could. Actually, that would make it relevant for younger, young, younger people to comprehend financial literacy, you know, and then incorporate some work free way into it, make right. it more fun because, you know, otherwise it was too boring. Some of the girls said, well, I'm not interested in finance. You know, I want to go to be you know, Blackpink. You know, seriously, that, that's really the dream. That's true that at a certain point, the, the that, numbers That's what difference. the business model is. And they say, why, why do I do want to do like finance and this boring stuff? So it needs to be somehow relatable to the daily life. And I can tell you, with the Asian mindset, okay, fine, M money, money is important, but respectability counts as well. And I mean, how, what, what parent wants to introduce their kid as a podcaster? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, certainly, certainly, what what are the the people in the Chinese and Indian communities that that I associate with? It, it, it's you can mention that in a in relation to other things, but most people want their kids to have a profession. 
I yeah. do, well, what yeah. friends or, do, but, but kids think about this very differently. I know we're sort of going in a different direction, but yeah, kids think about this very differently because their view of success and that their view of what's impact to the world and what they think is job satisfaction is completely different. Bringing themselves up to speed on this uh, new emerging technology can hopefully lead to maybe the entrepreneurial spark yeah. being being lit uh, in terms of they can they can find their place in the whole new milieu of uh, Web three. No, so uh, yeah, so this is for niche. girls and then boys. It's all about sports cards, basketball cards. You know, they right. collect yeah. them. So they, they from a very young age. I don't, right yeah, now. I don't have. Yeah, I don't have kids, but I now because of what I do, I deal with a lot of younger gen. So that's they do yeah. basketball cards, and that's also all the gen. Some of the genesis of why NFT, you know, those collectibles started yeah. because people know the concept of basketball cards. They they really idolize um, all these NBA players, um, and then you know they turn into collectibles. So that's kind of a whole trend of how mm -hmm. from a very young age, actually, kids get to understand or come into sort of exposure of what for related things. In the time we have left, is there anything you, you feel you'd like to say or anything you feel we haven't addressed yet? Or? Um, I think I might just pick up your point early on about um, sort of legal regulatory system yeah. of, in Hong Kong. I personally am very like happy with how things have been in the last sort of 12, 18 months in terms of how things have progressed. but. I think one um, challenge, or there are many, but one that I see, it's um, benchmarking in terms of how people can really tell certain company or web three projects they are really legit. I think that's a, that's very topical for me because I come through a lot of people, companies that, um, in my view, may not be entirely credible, but has a, if, you know do a lot of marketing, big PR. And it just strikes me, because I was thinking about this before I came over, that, so what benchmark do people use? It seems like the only thing that, or one of the few is, um, are you licensed or not? Yeah. That, that's Pretty literally, is a, exactly. Yeah. So there, there needs to be more ways to benchmark actually, other than are you licensed? Because I mean, you know, the regulator can only give so many licenses and they're not gonna give like hundreds of them. Um, so what, what are the, some of the other ways? And, and also, um, you know, bring on an earlier point that we talked about too. So SFC finally came out um, with some, like a circular, like early on about some companies pretended they applying for licenses, which they're not, uh, you know, they're operating in a period, um, you know, they should be operating a certain way, but they're not, but they're holding out. So all these things, I think, you know, things like investor alerts, um, you know, more sort of communication marketing on this aspect mm -hmm. would be exceptionally helpful because right now it's very, very hard to tell. Everything is Web3, everything, it's um, no matter, there's a hype. Um, and because of the business supporting environment that the Hong Kong government has right now, a lot of other companies, even from other regions are coming. So it's very hard from a lot normal layman to tell. Like, so yeah, the categorization and the classification correct. of it. In, in where which does it fit? Yes, yeah, where does which box does it fit? Lastly, uh, in this age of fintech and crypto and Web three, what does this mean for the role of a compliance officer at a financial good, good institution? How, how will their role change? change? That's a very good question. Um, I, I, you know, obviously, it's. Oh, well, it, is this just another medium? Is this, well, because the corollary to this question is, will rules for an age of banking and insurance and securities and futures fit crypto? That That's another, I mean, a related thread to, to that. Mm -mm. Um, more than often, um, I feel that I hear about, not just crypto, digital assets in general, people wait for technology solutions to come out to solve a problem. Right. So, because I seriously have interviewed extensively, uh, you know, compliance officers that to be hired and, and, you know, at different at different places I've been. Usually, um, there's a lot of ex-police who, who are very suitable because you know, of their background, they've, they've done sort of they've done financial crime and, yeah. and they're very skillful. And, you know, there are other professions too who, who would be interested because this is kind of the new wave, I think, it's kind of go forward. but. I, I always hear about, um, you know, oh. give you a very perfect example, real life didn't make this up, but so how do you determine, you know, things like manipulation 
you know, because if you was a stock, you know, you can, mm -hmm. your clear was about marking the close when you do wash trades, it's much harder for digital assets. And then the response was, oh, well, wait for a tech solution to come out. So I, I think people, I, so I said, well, what if it doesn't? <laughs> then it was blank. So I think it's very telling um, on, if you hire someone like me, who's like older, older, like more traditional compliance officer, I wouldn't probably, I would have to learn like what, number one, what solutions are available. But then if there were none, you know, Solutions can only give you exceptions to mm -hmm. look at. They can flag things. At the end of the day, it's still human decisions. So I think it just need, I think the industry just needs to develop. There needs to be people who have more experience, not just pro relying completely on tech platforms. They need to be able to assess, like you know, when an exception comes out, is this a true exception or not? And you know, what requires like reporting, as a sus suspicious activities. I think initially people will probably usually overdo it because it was just not clear. It's not clear. I think as the market and if things become more mature, then the approach will be refined. So as a compliance officer, I think at this day and age, I think the few things is you really need to know the job that you do. Is it going to be replaced by AI or by system? Secondly is, you know, how reliable are those systems and the different type of solutions and how you use them. I think that's kind of the best that you can do, really. To your point about in, it, initially people are going to overdo it. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we've seen this with deluge of filings. You'll be too extreme. People, the firms, will either decide, I'm just not going to do it. Or other extreme is, okay, let's overdo it. As, As in de-risking, yeah, de-risking, um, uh, de-banking. I'm not going to deal with this particular category uh, of, of client. Uh, you know, we saw that with FATCA. Um, and now with even uh, certain AML statutes. Or as you said, they'll overdo it, and then they'll get the regulators coming back at them and saying, "No, you have to be able to articulate your suspicion." And uh, then there's the view that pretty soon your financial crime team is going to be headed up by a data scientist. That substantive knowledge that. of AML KYC won't matter as much. Mm -hmm. That it's about trawling the data pool. It's about scraping data, uh, discerning patterns, and the, that, that's what's going to matter more. I mean, but I mean, of course, the compliance professionals say no because you can do a lot with technology nowadays, but that doesn't give you context. That, that I mean, it, it, it was uh, one Stuart Potter, a U.S. Supreme Court justice, who, whose definition of obscenity was "I know it when I see it," and someone who's a professional, a licensed, experienced professional, can discern things an algorithm probably, mm -hmm. probably can't. But again, the you know, as Oliver Wendell Holmes said, the life of the law has been experienced. Yeah, uh, I, I, which I don't think that it can ever be replaced because at the end of the day, you need, still need a human being to decide, like, if a certain case or exception. I mean, data is extremely powerful. You know, I, I, I don't doubt you. Like, I think that's going to be exceptionally important, I, particularly in fintech, but I don't think we'll see a world where you can just have a robot or some data, you know, some somebody who knows data but doesn't know the law, the rules um, to make a decision. Precisely, the statistics are useful, I find, when they're used in support of a particular uh, case or position or, or argument that, that, that um, it, they can they can illuminate, but but you have to get the context right because there are a lot of disingenuous people who would use statistics to make a case that, that that's you know un, 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 unwarranted. The other point that that's come up is that you won't necessarily lose your job to AI. You're going to lose your job to a human being so using AI. AI. The, 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 again, a recurring theme on the show. I think the cardinal question in the 21st century is going to be uh, how well does your labor complement technology? How well do you work right. with technology? How how well does your labor complement the results of technology? And if, if, if the answer is positive, it's in the affirmative. Your future, if not, less so. I mean, I they say it's going to take copy editors out of commission, but I I don't see that. But there is a concern that, that white 
low level skill white collar professionals mm -hmm. are imperiled by AI, perhaps more so than blue collar people. No, no, I, I agree. And, um, and also, again, AI just like Web3 is like overused because I have so many what is it? Yeah, company, what is it mean? company yeah. like pitching is that, oh, I'm going to use AI to help you read all your rules, like read all the regular genius. But I said, Red tech. Yeah, yes, yes. I said, so as you know, working from Thomson Reuters, I said, Thomson Reuters could completely do that before you have all this AI solution. So what is it that you can just brand something as, well, this is AI. Well, AI probably existed many centuries ago. So <laughs> it's like, what, so, you know, what problem are we trying to solve? Vivian, thank you for joining thank us. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you for your time and please come back again. Thank you. And to our viewers, thank you again and until next time.